A train traveling along the Kettle Valley Line in the dead of night in late October 1924. Near Farron, a day coach on that train explodes. The sound echoes throughout the region. At first, it is reported two are dead, then three, then four. The injured are rushed to hospital in nearby Castlegar. The explosion was described as something that had never been seen in the history of the Canadian Pacific Railway. The gas tanks under the day coaches had the gas that was used for illuminating the coaches themselves and were in sealed containers. The idea of how they could explode was hard to fathom, but explode the coach did. As the scene is investigated, more information comes to light. One of the dead was Peter Berrigan, also known as Lordly. His secretary, at least reported to be a secretary, Marie Strelaif, was also among the killed. In all, eight people died, including John Mackay, a member of the British Columbia Provincial Legislature. Immediately, accusations started to fly around about how such an explosion was possible and who was responsible. The federal government suspected it was people within the Dukabor community, while the Dukabors suspected it was the Canadian government. So, who was the person responsible for the death of Peter Berrigan, the spiritual leader of the community Dukabors? Why would someone want him killed? Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well known, but not necessarily well known nationwide. And while much of the history of Canada is solidly rooted in fact, there are a number of stories which leave more questions than answers. They are just as much a part of the history of Canada as any other story. These are mysteries, legends, myths, and some stories that shiver the soul. These stories are just as important as the ones we all know about. And we will be telling one of those stories today. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. As we delve into the questions surrounding Peter Berrigan's death, we must first look at the culture he came from, his life leading up to the moment of his death, and much more. As we stated, Berrigan was the spiritual leader of the Dukabors, but who were the Dukabors? They are known as being pacifists to the extreme and known for their communal structure of their communities. In fact, they are referred to as just one community. Also called the Union of Spiritual Communities of Christ, they started in Russia in the early 1700s. At least, that is the first time they appear in the written records, but they may have been around for well before that. The Dukabors rejected the idea of priesthood, at least in the Russian Orthodox Church, and the use of icons in the church rituals. A very spiritual people, they believed the Bible isn't enough for divine revelation, and that doctrine can't interfere with their faith. The first Dukabors very much believed that God's presence is in every human being. The name Dukabor itself was actually intended to mock the movement. It was given to them by the Archbishop of Tekaterinoslav, saying that they were heretics fighting against the Holy Spirit. This is where we should mention that Dukabor means spirit wrestler in Russian. The name adopted by the group and they used it to imply they were fighting alongside the Holy Spirit, not against it. The Dukabors were also intense pacifists, and they rejected military institutions and war. This would see them oppressed in Russia. Tsar Alexander I came up with the idea to resettle the Dukabors and other religious minorities to the steppe lands along the Black and Azov Seas. This was so the heretics couldn't contaminate the rest of the population. When Nicholas I came to the throne in 1826, he looked to assimilate the Dukabors by conscripting them to the military and prohibiting their gatherings. Those who were conscripted were sent to the Caucasus region, while the women and children were forcibly resettled to the Transcaucasian provinces such as Georgia. In 1886, when the leader of the Dukabors, Lukeria Vasilevna Gubanova, passed away, the leadership was passed along to her assistant. Peter Vasilievich Berrigan. Most of the community accepted him as the leader, but a portion did not. When it was said that he was to be acclaimed as the leader at a service in January 1887, he was arrested and was sent away on an internal exile. He first went to Arkhangelsk, then Kola, 
the northernmost settlement in Russia at the time, and then he was transferred to northwestern Siberia in 1894. While he was in transit to Siberia, Berrigan sent a message to the Duke of Bors, asking them to remember the commandment to not kill, to destroy all weapons, and to refuse military service. The confrontations between the government and the Duke of Bors came to a head in June 1895. After months of conscripts laying down their arms and refusing service, the Duke of Bors of the Transcaucasia region assembled in three towns and burned all the weapons they owned and could find. The army took action by sending Cossacks into those communities and forcing the Duke of Bors to be dispersed to remote communities in the area. Hearing this, Berrigan wrote to Tsar Nicholas's wife, Alexandra, and suggested that the Duke of Bors be resettled either to a remote part of Russia where the government would leave them alone or to Canada. An agreement was reached and the Duke of Bors would start to move over to Canada in 1898. In all, around 7,500 would move to this new country. Berrigan would be released from his internal exile in 1902 and he would join the Duke of Bors in Yorkton, Saskatchewan that December. In Saskatchewan, the Duke of Bors would set up communities in that or Yorkton area, northwest of Kamsak. Uh, when the new Canadian Northern Railway passed through the Duke of Bors lands, the station was named Verrigan Siding after the leader. It was misspelled, of course, V-E-R-E-G-I-N, as opposed to V-E-R-I-G-I-N. And that community still stands today, with a population of 70, northeast of Yorkton. In 1905, the Duke of Bors rejected the requirements of the Dominion Lands Act to have land registered as under individual ownership. After all, they owned everything in common. This would result in 1908, Berrigan leading around 6,000 Duke of Bors to British Columbia. They would still maintain property and facilities in Saskatchewan, and the headquarters of the Christian community of Universal Brotherhood would remain in Berrigan. But Lordly would have a home built near Grand Forks, British Columbia and he would spend time traveling between the two provinces. Arriving in British Columbia, they would purchase over 6,000 hectares of land at first and add it to it. They worked hard, establishing orchards, a sawmill, a jam factory, and more. There were 90 communal towns set up, and it was considered a utopian society by those there, at least many of them, people living together, sharing work, food, and possessions in a moneyless society. Now, of course, this system of living started to run afoul of the other homesteaders in Saskatchewan and British Columbia. There was a demand that all children go to school, especially those of minorities. This went against the beliefs of the Duke of Bors. Over the years, there were a number of those in the community who would find themselves sent to jail or fined for not sending their children to school. The tensions were rising between the Duke of Bors, the government, and the citizens of British Columbia. The Duke of Bors protested the education requirement and other things, and those protests were done in the complete nude. They also burned down public schools. While Berrigan himself didn't call for the burning of these schools, there were elders who did call for them. In testimony to the Expanded Kootenai Committee on Intergroup Relations in 1982, Nikolai Novakshinov said, quote, I am not going to attempt to explain as to when and why Duke of Bors took on the use of fire. I will only say it was not only the Sons of Freedom that were involved in the act of fire. There were instances at different times when people from other groups, community people, members of the Christian community of Universal Brotherhood, and also the independent farmers took part. They were involved in fires. Yes, the Freedomites, as the heads of the Duke of Bors, they were more active in this type of work. It has been left in my memory an incident, incidents in 1924. In one night, schools burned of all the settlements of the members of Christian Community of Universal Brotherhood. Seven schools in this district and the burning of these schools they were dispatched with by the members of the community people themselves without any Sons of Freedom taking part. This happened at Easter when the teachers were all away at home. In every district there were members elected for one year as trustees in regards to the community affairs. They were called elders. There was one elder that was elected that was head of all the other elders. The one that was serving without being changed or continuously. His name was Wasser Vyashin. His name was Chernenkov, but he was known under the nickname of Vyashin. Under his orders or command at the time was a team of white horses and a buggy. From time to time he went throughout the villages and was overseeing the activities of different villages. Coming through the villages just before Easter, Vyashin told every elder of village at a certain time of the night at Easter that a school must be burned. Either do it yourself with a helper or find two trustworthy people 
so this would be achieved. Unquote. After the burning of the schools, Berrigan would arrive in British Columbia. He asked if the schools had been destroyed, and when it was confirmed, pointed out they would have to answer for those schools. In further testimony, Dimakshinov testified that Berrigan had pleaded with the community that they should perhaps look at the concept of education in the school system so they wouldn't lose everything they had as a result of fines and seizures of things once they could no longer afford to pay the fines in cash. After 12 years, things had reached the point to burn the schools. The conflicts between the Dukabors and those around them were many. There were also those in the community who were upset at Berrigan initially for building himself a large house in Grand Forks, as well as almost ruling over the communities in an almost feudal nature. Of course, there were those who were upset he would compromise on certain issues, such as education, even if it wasn't a complete compromise. We now shift to just after midnight on the Kettle Valley Line near Farron, B.C. on October 29, 1924. Farron was a minor station. It was mostly used for crew and equipment. And there were no roads to the station, which was in the Monashi Mountains. Even to this day, there are no roads to where Farron used to be. It lies along the Columbia and Western Rail Trail, north of Paulson, almost perfectly between Grand Forks and Castlegar. Car 1586 would explode, killing six people initially. Two more would die from the injuries they suffered in the coming days. Dukabors. Police, CPR officials rushed to the scene by rail using special trains and handcars. Among the dead is mentioned Berrigan and John Mackay, the member of the BC legislature for the riding of Grand Forks Greenwood. In fact, the fact that Mackay was on the train as well led to some speculation as to the intended target of the explosion, but we will get to that more in the coming moments. Also among those who were killed in the explosion, Berrigan, his secretary, Mackay, Hakeem Singh, PJ Campbell, Harry J. Bishop, W. J. Armstrong, and Neil E. Armstrong. The day after the explosion, the cause was determined. We go to the Nelson Daily News, published on October 30th, 1924. Quote, Deaths of eight persons, two still unidentified, and injuries to a dozen others were caused by the terrible explosion that at a few minutes after one o'clock yesterday morning almost blew to pieces the day coach on the westbound Kettle Valley train from Nelson, the explosion being followed by fire. Instead of being an explosion of the illuminating gas tank of the coach, as at first reported to the Canadian Pacific Railway authorities at Nelson, it was conceded yesterday that a high explosive, illicitly within the car, by accident or by design, caused the terrible catastrophe. A railway car with only the wheels and steel framework left intact, fragments of clothing scattered in the snow and even caught in the trees, the steel framework only of a suitcase found 200 feet from the wreck, with charred bits of letter leading directly from the car to the frame, are all that were left late yesterday to tell of the terrible accident at Farron. Unquote. Staff Sergeant Ernest Gammon of the Provincial Police was quoted as saying in the article, quote, We know it must have been caused by a high explosive, but that is almost all we know so far. It may have been a bomb in a grip, it may have been nitroglycerin in some form, or it may have been a war trophy which went off. And now so little is left of the car because it was burned to ashes that it will be very difficult to find out just what happened, but pieces of the car were blown 300 feet away." Unquote. The engineer, William Harkness, explained what he saw happen that night. In his statement to the police, he said, quote, Just inside the West Mile board at Farron, around 24 kilometers, I heard a very heavy explosion. The emergency brakes automatically set. We were running about 20 miles an hour at the time, and I would say that we stopped in about three coach lengths. I looked back and saw a coach on fire. I reversed the engine, set up independent brake, and the fireman and myself went back and assisted to get the passengers out of the burning coach. We both worked together with the other members of the train crew, doing all we could to help. While I was in the burning coach, I distinctly heard a number of small explosions that sounded like dynamite caps or small cartridges exploding. I did think at first there was trouble with the gas tanks exploding. The only reason I thought of this was because there was nothing else around the train that could explode. As soon as we had all the passengers out, I went and made a personal examination of the tanks before the burning car was got away from the sleeper and found them undisturbed in any way, being intact and in position. After this, I went to the engine to pull the burning car away from the sleeper, which I did, moving up about a car length or so. Then we got clear of the burning car entirely and moved ahead. There was nothing more I could do in the interest of safety. I stayed with my engine as we were standing on a descending grade. 
and they remained on the engine until we proceeded to Midway. In the meantime, I allowed my fireman to go back and continue working with the train crew." Unquote. He added that he came to the conclusion a pipe leading up into the coach had broken off, resulting in gas escaping and then exploding. A coroner's inquest was called the evening of October 29th, just hours after the explosion. They examined the bodies of the men who were recovered at the scene. A second inquest, starting on November 1st in Nelson, would look into the deaths of the other four. The inquest in Grand Forks would wrap up the same day the second inquest started. They would come to the conclusion that the explosion came about due to a high explosive placed within the passenger coach by persons unknown. The inquest also noted two exhibits which were uncovered during the investigation, a dry cell battery and a clock. These were proposed to be part of a time bomb and were submitted as evidence by CPR Constable Edward J. House. Here is the description of the evidence from the Nelson Daily News on November 3rd. Quote, two pieces of suggested mechanism were produced. One was the main portion of an alarm clock of Italian manufacture with works exposed. It had been picked up close to where the ill-fated car burned. The alarm spring was run down, but the time spring was wound up, and the hands indicated 6 o'clock. A short piece of copper wire was found soldered to one of the cog wheels and was suggested as being the connecting link with the battery to the cause of the explosion. The clock had apparently gone through the fire. The other section of the plant was what appeared to be the upper half of a dry cell battery. An unusual feature was that fastened to the metal top of the battery was a tape-like piece of tin or rolled copper four inches in length, and while at the opposite terminal was attached a copper cap about the size of an ordinary oil can top. This was thoroughly examined by jurymen and officials at the inquest, as well as by local electricians, and opinion is unanimous that nothing like it had been seen before. It was declared that no battery of this kind was in use in the equipment of the railway company. The remnant of the battery had been found 50 feet up the embankment from the location of the coach when the explosion took place, but four car lengths from the car was found. The battery was torn, but not burned in any way. Having the circumstances in mind, Constable House declared he thought the clock and battery were parts of a time bomb or infernal machine. Unquote. Now that the coroner's inquest had determined the deaths were due to foul play, who were those considered as suspects? Given that there were two people of prominence on the train at the time of the explosion, it does mean that there is the possibility either of one could have been the target of an assassination, either Peter Berrigan or the member of the legislature, John Mackay. The chances of a plot to kill Mackay, however, are very, very minimal, and thus most attention, rightfully so, has focused on who would want to kill Peter Berrigan. We will first start with the possibility of it being an accident. As we have mentioned, there was gas that was used for lighting the car, which was contained in the tanks below. Of course, it was testified that it wasn't the possibility. What about perhaps someone having something explosive in their baggage, like dynamite? Old dynamite that was weeping could possibly become extremely reactive, if that one scene from a movie I saw a couple decades ago is accurate. Many of the Ducabors in the area initially believed the explosion that killed Berrigan was an accident. They couldn't fathom someone would want their leader dead. But if the explosion was an assassination, who would want him dead? The British Columbia and Canadian governments weren't happy with the situation involving the Ducabors. There was the desire to live communally, to educate themselves, and to embrace pacifism. They worked hard and would establish their own communities with strong economies. Just days after the death of Berrigan, the accusations started with some of the members of the Christian Community of Universal Brotherhood shifting their ideas that it was an accident to one where the death was carried out as part of a plot by the Canadian government. In an open letter to the BC government, Anastasia Holubava wrote, quote, Our opinion that you have destroyed Mr. Berrigan with intention to squelch the community, as Justice Morrison has frankly displayed his attitude at the bench of the court. He stated to the jury that they were in British Columbia and that the Dukabor community meant nothing to them. In fact, the following is his exact words. The sooner that it was squelched, the better. You thought that you would squelch our community, but we will say that you will never squelch it. The authorities similar to you thought when they would kill Christ to glory, his teachings would be banished. But Christ has seeded his seeds on earth, and it began to multiply. Same thing applies to our community, which will exist forever. Although you are unable to raise Mr. Berrigan from death, but we put on you a fine of responsibility 
as he was our great irreparable leader, maintained us as his children. At the present time, we remain similar to small children without parents, which children are unable to obtain maintenance because they are small. Consequently, we file a heavy claim against you for the body of Mr. Berrigan, but for his ir irreparable intellectual faculties. We feel that you have destroyed Mr. Berrigan with intention that will enable you to, in easiest way, to squelch the idea of a holy community." Unquote. Another group that was looked at as possible suspects was the nativists of British Columbia. Nativists were essentially white men who wanted no outsiders who didn't carry the same values as them. They were against the idea of immigrants, not just from India and China in the early 1900s, but Eastern and Southern Europe. The First World War would only lead to more resentment of the Duke of Orr community, as they were exempt from military service, while thousands went off to fight for king and empire. Add in the fact that Duke of Orr's lived communally. Wasn't this just like what the Bolsheviks were calling for in Russia? What if the Duke of Orr's were secretly Asian provocateurs for the Bolsheviks? Yes, racism and fear were two powerful motivators for the nativist movement. There was also the purchase of a significant amount of land in Oregon by Berrigan. Was he possibly thinking of moving from BC to the United States? It has even been speculated the KKK wanted to keep the Duke of Ors from moving to Oregon and took the action of killing Berrigan to get them to remain in Canada. There were also factions within the Duke of Ors themselves. While we may think of them as a homogenous group, they were anything but. Here in Canada, there was the Christian community of Universal Brotherhood, of which Berrigan was the leader. There were independents who had broken away from the Brotherhood. There were what were called the Svobodniki, which rejected modernism, government, and their laws. There were also purists and zealots who thought Berrigan did too much to compromise. This is why his home in Saskatchewan had been burned down in 1916, and they were suspected of torching his home in Brilliant, B.C. in April of 1924. The RCMP, the Provincial Police, and the CPR Police investigated a number of leads, but they would end up coming up with nothing that implicated the Duke of Ors to the explosion aside from innuendo and suspicion. Another possible suspect, the Soviet government. Now, why the Soviets? After the revolution in Russia in 1917, it appeared like a situation where the two could work together. After all, a number of Duke of Ors wanted to return home to Russia, not satisfied with life in Canada. The Soviets wanted more and more people of Russian descent to relocate back to the homeland. And given that the community Dukabors were familiar with how to operate an agricultural commune, they were especially welcome. However, Berrigan wasn't too keen on the idea. He wanted assurance that Russia would remain a pacifist country, be neutral at all times, and stop all military services. This wasn't going to happen, and so Berrigan's resolve to return to the homeland disappeared while the Soviets still wanted the Duke of Ors to come back. This theory, however, was dismissed by the RCMP, including by one Sergeant J.W. Campston of the Yorkton Detachment. In 1925, regarding the possibility of Bolshevik agitation, he wrote, quote, With regard to the assumption by P.J. Berrigan of the possibility of Peter Berrigan having met his death as the result of the activities of some agent of the Soviet government, I can see no motive for such an action, and my investigation does not disclose any. The authorities are no doubt aware that there have been two factions within the community Duke of Ors in BC striving for supremacy this last few years, the split having been caused by the desire of the more liberal-minded among the community Duke of Ors for schools and education within the community. This has always been strictly tabooed by the conventional Duke of Ors and has led to struggles between what I might call the fundamentalists and modernists among the Duke of Ors, resulting last year, I believe, in the burning of several schools on the property of the community in BC last year. As is well known, the Duke of Bor is recruited from the very primitive-minded Russian peasant, and as such is very lacking in self-control. And I think it quite possible that a member of the faction opposed to Peter Berrigan, whilst actuated by one of the emotional impulses these people give way to, was responsible for the Baron disaster. Unquote. Even when looking at the possibility, it was the Bolsheviks. It came back around to the Duke of Bors themselves and the fractures within the community. There was one more theory that came out around 40 years after the death of Berrigan that was put forward by a reporter from the Vancouver Sun. Sima Holt suggested that Berrigan's own son was the man behind the explosion, as he wanted to take the place of his father as the head of the communes. After Berrigan died, a mass meeting was held six weeks later to elect a new leader. The two final candidates were Berrigan's son, who was known as 
Chistiakov and Anastasia Holubova, Berrigan's partner. It would be Chistiakov who was selected as the leader, even though he was still back in Russia. Representatives from the Dukobor community went back to Russia to tell him of his selection as a leader. But he would end up being thrown in jail before he could come to Canada to take up his father's mantle. The reason? Drunkenness and assault. He would be released three years later and would come to Canada in 1927. Chistiakov's time as a leader of the Dukobors in Canada would be rather tragic. Not only was he in charge of the commune as it endured the Great Depression, he also drank and gambled away most of the money of the Christian community of Universal Brotherhood. By 1938, many of the communes had fallen apart and Chistiakov passed away in 1939. The theory from Holt states, quote, I figure that Peter hated his father bitterly for the abandonment of his mother, also because of the hate inculcated by his mother's parents and relatives. He heard nothing else. When he came to Canada in 1906, he saw a mint of dough his father was making out of these ignorant people. He didn't like his father any better on meeting him. Meanwhile, the wild element among the Duke of Boers liked the high living Peter, and he made friends with him in 1906. As he grew older, his love for money and gambling grew. He knew where there was a pile of it. He wasn't doing too well on the people in Russia, and he thought the Canadian types could do better from what he saw of his father's prosperity and later learned from his friend of the great empire his father had built in the CCUB. He was in trouble with the Russian government. He was being thrown into jail periodically. He felt certain, and probably the people he was corresponding with encouraged him, that he would be the successor to his father. He knew that even if he did not come to Canada, he could get thousands of them. And he did in the three years between 1924, his father's death, and the time he came here in 1927. He probably wanted to speed his inheritance and at the same time get rid of his father, who he despised. Unquote. Now, we touched on the collapse of the commune, but what happened after that? While well, protests would continue from the Dukobors, who would often use nudism and arson to get their point across. In less than 50 years, the Svobodniki faction would have committed more than 1,100 acts of violence. Of course, most Dukobors actually believed these actions to be outside of the central principle of nonviolence, and therefore the Svobodniki didn't deserve to be called Dukobors. Today, Canadian Dukobors no longer live communally and reject many things such as church organization, literal interpretation of many parts of the scriptures, and partisan politics. Around 40,000 people of Dukobor ancestry live in Canada, but only around 2,300 identify as Dukobor in terms of religion, the majority in British Columbia and Saskatchewan. The successor of the Christian community of Universal Brotherhood, the Union of Spiritual Communities of Christ, is still in existence the largest formal Dukobor organization. It has its headquarters in Grand Forks, British Columbia. So there, all of the theories have been put forward. Now, who do I think it was? Myself, I believe it was likely a person from one of the many factions of Dukobors, who saw that the feudal regime Berrigan had built for himself was too much like what they had fled from in Russia. Of course, we are now 98 years removed from this murder, and the leads have only drawn colder and we will likely never truly know who is the person responsible for the death of the man who led the Dukobors to Canada. It is a mystery that will be continued to be debated for years to come, but let us know what you think. Share your thoughts on the death of Peter Verrigan on our social media platforms. We look forward to the discussion, and maybe we can use some of these comments in a follow-up episode in the future. Coming up on Sunday, we'll be continuing our look at the War of 1812. This week, we'll talk about the Battle of Oswego, the Burning of St. David's, and the Battle of Lundy's Lane, the bloodiest engagement in the entire war. We also have a couple of special episodes coming up Friday. We will be joined by other Canadian history content creators for a special episode talking about how, despite the trope, Canadian history isn't boring. And Jamie Neugebauer will be coming back for a chat with us about the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. We'll also chat a little bit about the war itself. And next Wednesday, in our next episode of Canadian History After Dark, we will talk about the Falcon Lake incident, perhaps the most well-documented, unexplained aerial phenomenon incident in history. Like and follow us on social media. This includes Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Every day we bring you our This Date in Canadian History feature, plus a lot more. Check out our YouTube and become a subscriber. We will be bringing more and more video content in the coming weeks. 
Speaking of video content, we are also working on a Kickstarter for our documentary series that tells some of the stories of Canada that are better told visually rather than just by audio. You can also support us on Patreon, and we have also started a GoFundMe to help support our endeavors. And follow along the podcast on your favorite platform. We'll be bringing you two episodes a week. One is Canadian History After Dark, and the other is our ongoing anthology series that looks at various events from Canadian history that may not be as well known nationwide as they are regionally. And thank you for listening to Canadian History After Dark.